Hi folks, welcome to your first lecture on Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. Fear and Trembling is a 200 page book devoted to explaining what's going on in a single passage from the Old Testament. So in order to know, understand what Kierkegaard is up to, you have to be familiar with the story of Abraham and Isaac from Genesis 22. So the first thing we'll do in this video is talk about what that passage is from the Old Testament and what the traditional Christian understanding of it is because Kierkegaard rejects that traditional Christian understanding. Kierkegaard, what's, Kierkegaard's view though is notoriously difficult. And so the other thing I wanna do in this video is show you how carefully all of the words are chosen and how careful we can read his text to get a lot out of it. His view is incredibly complicated, but also very subtle and insightful. And so what I wanna do is to give you an appreciation um, for how much thought you can put into the interpretation to see what Kierkegaard is up to. Okay, let's start with Abraham and Isaac. So Abraham has, has this foundational role um, and is, is known as a godly man, has, is an exemplar of a person with the right relationship, a holy or pious person and the right relationship with God. So you can imagine his surprise when an angel of God comes down and tells him he has to sacrifice his, his only son. Uh, so, but what does Abraham do? Does he balk and um, reject? No, he does exactly what God says. He, he takes Isaac and goes up onto the mountain and goes through all the motions and is perfectly willing uh, to sacrifice his son if God says so. Now, on the traditional Christian understanding, what that means is that Abraham is, is blessed. He shows us exactly what the pious ought to do, which is absolutely anything that God commands, no matter how absurd it, or, or incomprehensible it might be. Um, if you have the right faith in God, then you're willing to do um, absolutely anything. So uh, what God says um, through the voice of the angel is, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. So this is a really interesting passage from the Christian point of view, because in Christianity, it's only later once Christ comes to earth that humans can be totally absolved of their sins and in the right relationship with God. But there's a way in which on the Christian interpretation, these passages from the Old Testament are sort of prefiguring. Abraham is almost like a pre-Christ-like figure and plays this role not just on behalf of himself or his family, but for all of humanity, he's doing something. Of course, the, this story and the figure of Abraham aren't just exclusive to Christianity. So all of these Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have long histories of interpretation of what's going on in these passages. And, the, and these passages are common texts for all of these religions. Uh, but it's, it's the Christian tradition in particular that Kierkegaard is reacting uh, against or, or speaking about. Okay, so that's the traditional Christian understanding that Abraham was a wonderful and praiseworthy person. And we can easily have this, this Sunday school understanding of what he did because what he, God asked him to do something, he was absolutely willing to do it. And isn't that praiseworthy? Um, that's the simple-minded understanding that Kierkegaard actually thinks is deeply problematic. Uh, okay, so let's start talking about Kierkegaard's own view. Here's a passage from page six of the PDF. I, for my part, can indeed describe the movements of faith, but I cannot perform them. What I want you to do is figure out who the I is in this passage. Is it Abraham? Is it Kierkegaard? Is it Johannes? So pause your videos. Um, if, if you don't, if you haven't already thought about this passage, pause your videos, find this passage in the text. See if you can figure it out before going on. Okay, I'm going to talk about the answer now. So that was your chance to pause your videos and go um, look at the text carefully. The I in, that, in this passage is the author, the I of the author, but the author is not Kierkegaard, or at least not straightforwardly Kierkegaard. The work is written with a pseudonym. So that I is Johannes de Silencio. That's, that's, or Silentio, that's who's talking there. Uh, but, so there's ways in which we have to be careful. When, when, the, when this character says, I don't have faith, which is sort of what this first passage says, I can describe the movements of faith, but I can't perform them. So he's saying, I lack the true faith of what Christianity is. That's not necessarily Kierkegaard saying he doesn't have faith. In fact, Kierkegaard, I think Kierkegaard does have, he is portraying himself as a person of, the right relationship. He's one of the few people who actually understands what faith is, but he's telling it through the eyes of a person who lacks it. So I want you to think about what is the structural or strategic, what is, what is the role, the literary role of using a pseudonym like this? Um, I, re I really mean for you to think about it. So pause your videos here. See if you can, can puzzle out why Kierkegaard would do such a thing. 
you might have thought um, Kierkegaard was doing it because he wanted anonymity. Uh, that's a common use of pseudonyms, especially in this time, especially in these older times when saying something anti-religious or anti-traditional religion could get you in a whole lot of trouble. But Kierkegaard was not doing it for anonymity. That was not the issue at all. Kierkegaard was well known to use many pseudonyms. His, his audience would have known exactly who wrote this. So anonymity was irrelevant. It was, it's a literary device. And he's actually saying something philosophically, quite deeply philosophically significant. There's multiple levels to this. And so I'm gonna talk about one of them in this video, but we're gonna to return to this and see many levels of significance to Kierkegaard's use of the pseudonym. It actually plays a deep philosophical role. First, you have to understand what the heck the pseudonym is a re reference to. So this is like level one, because Kierkegaard is continually making these references to classical literature and would is, expect his audience, he knows his texts are hard to read. They are incredibly dense and, and every word is carefully chosen, but he thinks his, his audience is willing to do the work to figure out what he's up to. So John of Silence or Johannes de Salentio is a reference to this grim fairy tale called the faithful servant. John of Silence, um, is the faithful servant and he's a servant to the master. The master is like the Abraham figure because there is sacrifice. The, so on the, on the first interpretation, John is like the son Isaac in the sense that he is sacrificed for the sake of the master. And interestingly, if you, you should go and check out the grim fairy tale, John sacrifices himself by breaking the silence and that's what saves the master. So this theme of speech and silence becomes central to Kierkegaard's work just by the choice of the pseudonym that Kierkegaard makes. What's interesting then is because the master is able to survive, he's saved, he then has two sons, but he wants to honor this amazing, this holy or pious act that John did. So the master, uh, understanding John's sacrifice, then does the incomprehensible and sacrifices his sons to save John, to bring John back. So here now, the sons are playing the Isaac role and the master again is like Abraham being willing to sacrifice his sons for something else, the, the pious or holy act of John. And then of course, so the grim fairy tales often have these wacky and bizarre endings. Like if you haven't read Little Red Riding Hood in the original grim version, the, the woodcutter comes and cuts open the wolf's stomach and Red Riding Hood emerges again. So all sorts of crazy things happen at the end of grim fairy tales. Well, John sort of miraculously brings the sun's back too, and it has a happy ending. But that happy ending masks a lot of brutal and, and incomprehensibly immoral acts that are going on throughout this. So this theme of Kierkegaard invoking the grim fairy tale here, it, it has parallels to the Abraham Isaac story, but also has this theme of, of speech, silence, and communication, which is gonna be important for Kierkegaard. So the, the theme of silence, brings forth the idea that there are limits to language. There are things that language can't say. Language just has to remain silent about. And here language and speech, again, are sort of metaphorically stand, metaphorical stand-ins for, for understanding. So Kierkegaard returns to these questions of the limits of speech and understanding and the role of silence throughout Fear and Trembling. I give you one quote here in blue from page two of the PDF. Um, people speak on, in, on, about Abraham's honor, but how can they do that? So what are the limitations of speaking uh, is what Kierkegaard is invoking here. Um, he also says, you know, we think we ha might have this great confidence in our faith, um, a sort of Sunday school understanding of Abraham as the father of faith, but that actually might mask a dim understanding. And the stronger and stronger our confidence, the less and less we might actually understand what's going on in there. So here we again have a, the theme of the limitations of understanding being raised. In another part of the text, so these things, original page 44, um, the, the full version of Kierkegaard is posted in Canvas if you want to check it out, not just the PDF selections that I posted for you. So you can find these on the original pagination, pages 44 and 45. In one part of Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard recounts what it must have been like for Abraham to go through all of these motions and slowly march up the mountain on the donkey in order to sacrifice Isaac. And he imagines Abraham riding in silence, again, um, drawing attention to this theme of speech and silence. Okay, so that's already to, to show you how much is going on just on the first, uh, on the cover page of Kierkegaard's text, merely by his choice of pseudonym. But even before we, we're not even to the text yet, there's an epigraph here, which is deeply significant as well. So 
don't, don't just skip over this. This is carefully chosen by Kierkegaard. Again, it's another complicated literary reference, which people who have like a classic Latin uh, uh, school history, Kierkegaard would expect, would understand. So here's the epigraph. Uh, what Tarquin the Proud said in his garden with the poppy blooms was understood by the son, but not by the messenger. Um, here again, we have this theme of father and sons. So Tarquin the Proud was one of the kings of uh, Rome, and he had a son. And uh, the story that's, so the background here, I'll give you the, I'll fill you in what Kierkegaard would presuppose or hope his audiences could get out of this. Tarquin the Proud was a king of Rome who was on like a military campaign trying to conquer another city. And he couldn't do it. They were too steadfast. It's sort of like the Greeks trying to conquer Troy. They had to come up with a KG or a deceitful way of winning. So what, what he does is he, Tarquin the Proud has his son uh, sort of beat up and look bruised to, to feign a dispute between him, him and his son. So the son then acts like he's being kicked out of his father's and chased away from his father's army, like he's disgraced, done something horrible. And he runs away to the city for refuge. And they, the city is taken in by the Rus. So they think the son really is, does hate his father and wants to conquer uh, the Roman army. He's going to help them. And so they actually, the son is this charismatic figure who wins the confidence of the city. And they actually put him in charge. So everybody in the city is anti-Roman except for the son. And, but, but nobody knows that about him. So the son then sends a messenger to his father's Roman army. But the messenger, of course, the messenger is, is, is not uh, loyal to the son. The messenger is actually loyal to the city. So the son needs to get a message from the king, from the Roman king, the emperor, without the messenger understanding it. The messenger goes and the messenger sees Tarquin the Proud standing in a garden, lopping off the poppy blossoms, uh, the, the flowers. And the messenger thinks he gets this message to bring back to the city. Uh, and tells Tarquin, but the messenger has no idea what he's do actually doing is he's the vehicle for the secret code between Tarquin and his son. The son understands the message to be, okay, I need to lop off all the heads of the generals and the prominent folks of the city because my father's about to come in here and then and win the war. And that's exactly what he does. So the messenger unwittingly carries this message that leads to the demise of his city. He's, he's a tool being used by Tarquin and the son. So what the heck is Kierkegaard doing with this as the epigraph to his text? Well, there's, again, there's the limits of understanding. This connects with the theme we talked about previously. The messenger doesn't get it. He, he fails to understand what the symbols and the significance of it is. And that, that contributes to this theme about people who don't understand. But also, there's a, the second message is Tar, Tarquin's son does understand. He does get the message. That's exactly what Tarquin wanted him to do. And then the Romans win. So this is supposed to be a victory uh, for Tarquin. Now, this, so this, this immediately relates to the themes that Kierkegaard set up with the pseudonym, John of Silence. But it does something else as well. It tells us that this text is like a hidden code. And it asks us, are we smart enough to understand what Kierkegaard's message is? So Kierkegaard is like Tarquin. We are like the audience. Who, who's, the, who's the messenger? Well, John of Silence in some ways is the messenger. John of Silence is the person who's telling us this, but it's a question, will we actually get it or not? Um, and it's special knowledge. For one thing, it's gonna take careful work and interpretation to understand what Kierkegaard is really telling us. He's not gonna necessarily come out and spell it out. And you might think, is he just being subtle? Does he wanna say that all deep philosophy, you have to hide behind confusions? No, actually there's a philosophical point to him not coming out and saying what his view is. So hopefully you'll, you'll get that by, by the end of interacting with his text. But one last bit that you have to know in order to understand what's really, at even a third level of what's going on here. Just before this text was published, so Kierkegaard was a famous public intellectual in Copenhagen. He was engaged to a woman named Regine Olsen. And uh, it, was, it was a complicated public relationship and Kierkegaard broke it off. And, and, it, and it was very humiliating for, these prom, for her prominent family. Uh, and it really destroyed her. So she was distraught. And, uh, and it's interesting, I mean, this was really painful for Kierkegaard and for her. And in some ways, why would Kierkegaard do such a thing? What could possibly motivate that? This text, in some ways, 
is an explanation of what his existential or philosophical motivations were in these very personal acts of his own relationship with his, with his fiance. And what he actually wants, wants to do is communicate to her. If she understands what he's saying about faith, she will understand why he had to do what he did. That's the additional layer to what's going on. And why would the story of Abraham and Isaac in any way be relevant to this? Because think what Kierkegaard's going to tell us is the Sunday school version of this, of the Abraham story is, 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 is a misunderstanding. It's garbage. It's terrible. Abraham, if we, we shouldn't simple-mindedly praise Abraham. Abraham is willing to do something that is monstrous, that is horrific and immoral. Why would he do such a thing? Well, it's, it might be because there's an act of deception here. He's doing it. He's willing to sacrifice his and do something immoral and in a sense maybe sacrifice his own moral standing in order so that Isaac would understand uh, be in the right relationship with God. So uh, in order for other people not to lose faith, he has to be able to do, he has to be willing to do things that are terrible. So I think the message for Regine here is Abraham did something that was horrible, but but really, it was it was an act to save not just uh, uh, not just to save Kierkegaard, but it was an act to save regime too. Um, it was it was in some sense for both of them, not just an act of total selfishness. So this complicated way in which the text is really a coded message to to Kierkegaard's um, ex fiance is not just random historical biographical detail. This is actually deeply significant for the existential import of the piece, or that's what I hope you come to understand uh, by the end of these um, lectures. Okay, that, that's the end of this lecture. This is all sort of the very beginning, the very first passages of the text and how complicated a set of details are there. Um, but once you understand those, I think we're ready to dive into the, mater the material next. Okay, thanks.